In the summer of 1990, Nintendo's new 16-bit machine was mere months away from its release, and Nintendo EAD was hard at work to crunch out the first lineup of games. The new capabilities of the console gave them more freedom to implement gameplay ideas, but they still ran into several limitations. For example, both Pilot Wings and F-Zero had a simulated 3D perspective, but all vehicles still had to be drawn manually from all possible angles. This made it very taxing on the overall cartridge space and limited the gameplay possibilities. The team experimented with 3D polygon airplanes, but struggled to make it run smoothly. It was around this time that a possible solution presented itself to Nintendo, thousands of miles away from their headquarters. Sometimes the birth of iconic video games are a result of a string of small events that fall into place like pieces of a puzzle. Dylan Cuthbert had recently quit school to join the London-based Argonaut Software and pursue a career in gaming. Its founder, Jez San, had been obsessed with 3D vector graphics from the moment he first lay eyes on Star Wars the Arcade Game back in 1983. He asked the recruit to develop a 3D engine for Nintendo's new handheld system. Cuthbert's tech demo managed to impress Nintendo at the summer CES trade show in 1990. Hardly a month later, San and Cuthbert were invited to Nintendo's headquarters to discuss Nintendo's struggle to implement 3D graphics on the Super NES. In a room filled with Nintendo's top talent, the young Jez San picked up the phone to consult hardware wizard Ben Cheese in the UK. He asked if it would be possible to increase the computing power via a RISC processor inside a Super NES cartridge. With some input from Nintendo's engineers, he was quickly able to confirm that this was indeed technically possible, and so the idea for the Super FX chip was born. From a business standpoint, a Nintendo game could often rely on selling over a million copies. This made the investment less risky and allowed them to negotiate a satisfying price per chip when ordered in these large amounts. After successive business meetings, Jez San was able to win Nintendo's trust to open their doors to a foreign company. They set up a joint venture to produce the FX chip. Nintendo bought the rights to Dylan's Game Boy demo project and allowed him to further develop the game with some support from Nintendo R&D One. Carl Graham and Pete Warrens from Argonaut Software started to familiarize themselves with Nintendo's 16-bit machine, resulting in a 3D tech demo called SNES Glider. Shortly after, real work began on the FX chip, then called Mario Chip at that point. The SNES Glider team wrote a 3D engine and the processor's instructions, while Ben Chi's electronic design was focused on the actual hardware implementation. By the end of 1991, a prototype development kit was ready and Argonaut and Nintendo began preparation of the first game to utilize the chip. Initially, the project started out as a free-roaming 3D shooter in the vein of Argonaut's Star Glider series. Producer Shigeru Miyamoto gave it some thought over the New Year break. He opted for more accessible and straightforward gameplay, which allowed for a more controllable game design process. As with most of his other iconic games, Star Fox would also be shaped by a real-world experience. While walking through the thousands of gates leading up to the Fushimi Inari Shrine in Kyoto, he imagined himself flying through the gates. Miyamoto's idea totally changed the project's course. The free-roaming design was dropped, and instead the player would have to maneuver through a carefully constructed obstacle course. After a quick test, the Argonaut team realized that the limited camera view was actually beneficial to the frame rate and the development process. While working on the Game Boy title X, Dylan Cuthbert flew from Japan to England and back on a regular basis. The situation was far from ideal, so on Star Fox he suggested to set up a base of operations in Japan. Together with two fellow talented programmers from Argonaut, he formed a unit within Nintendo, working from their own small office space. The FX chip was well suited for math calculations, but it would still require clever programming to make it output 3D models. Carl Graham and Pete Warrens from Argonaut Software took up the challenge and programmed the powerful 3D engine used in Star Fox. Their code utilized the FX chip inside the game cartridge to draw polygons and rasterize them to 2D pixel data. The onboard RAM served as a frame buffer to store the results while a frame was being rendered. Via direct memory access, the image is transferred to the video RAM inside the Super NES. There, the rendered image is combined with the 2D pixel art backgrounds and HUT elements to form the final game screen. The polygons are lit via a virtual light source. All the shading effects had to comply to the strict Super NES color palette structure. The biggest obstacle was to transfer the rendered graphics data to the Super NES video RAM within an acceptable frame rate. They ultimately had to lower the resolution slightly and mask the rest of the image with black borders to make this work. 
Apart from displaying polygons, the chip and software engine could also plot dots. This would prove useful for various effects like explosions, for example. Miyamoto's preferred way of working was to organically shape a game along the way and not plan out every detail beforehand. He would sit behind programmer Giles Goddard for weeks while smoking his cigarettes. Together they would meticulously tweak and perfect the R-Wing's controls and camera movements. Miyamoto was not hands-on involved in every single detail, but getting the feel of the controls right was always a priority to him. The Argonaut programming team helped to shape the game with their own know-how of 3D gameplay and creative input. Their tech demos and tweaking with the hardware resulted in various interesting effects and enemy motions. They also had a big hand in creating the level bosses and coming up with rough event ideas which would be tweaked by Nintendo's team. Director of the project Iguchi and his assistant Yamada gathered all ideas and mapped out the stage layouts by hand. The levels don't exist as complete 3D maps, but are actually a list of scripted events that create objects and enemies. Giles Goddard developed a special macro language to make the process of programming and tweaking these events more manageable. Halfway through the project, the programming team was faced with another challenge. Their DOS machine started to run out of memory while compiling the complex program code into a game build. With their nerves of steel, they rewrote the assembler and managed to find a workaround in their already hectic schedule. After hours, the team frequently visited the local arcades. Namco's 3D shooter Starblade was one of their favorites and a big inspiration. The Armada stage of Star Fox in particular was an homage to this arcade classic. Two employees of Nintendo's own team worked on the graphic design of the game. Imamura did most of the 2D pixel art. Watanabe would model and design the 3D vehicles and objects. Both men were recruited at the start of the 16-bit generation and worked on A Link to the Past. Watanabe was new to the concept of 3D modeling, but was able to give each craft, with a very limited amount of polygons, a recognizable shape as well as a unique character. To create the 3D models, he used a custom-made 3D tool that ran directly on the Super NES hardware. Three members of Nintendo's tech team developed this simple but effective tool, making it possible to see and edit his work in real time on the console hardware. All backgrounds in the game were done traditionally with 2D pixel art. This helped to add more detail and contributed to its unique aesthetic. However, it required some skill to make them interact and blend together. The art direction was key in this. Levels all have their own overall color tone. For example, the objects in Corneria have a slightly bluish tint, while a meteor is made up of browns and dark greens. This stage is intentionally made darker to give the player an extra challenge by limiting their view. The 3D objects would all match the tone of each level by infusing more red, blue, or green into the gray tones. To make the 2D backgrounds tilt in line with the 3D camera movements, they shifted lines of pixels in a vertical direction. A matrix of little dots were rendered by the FX chip to add a sense of movement to the static backgrounds. By the summer of 1992, the project started to take shape, but one of its defining elements was still missing, its main cast. Miyamoto didn't necessarily want anything too complex or violent in terms of storyline. He thought back to one of his favorite TV series as a child, Thunderbirds. This hit series inspired him to add cinematic flair to the game and have clear, distinct characters. After some discussion with 2D artist Takuya Imamura, it was decided to have the game star anthropomorphic animals instead of humans. A sketch of a fox character immediately clicked with the team, and from then on, Star Fox started to gain its own identity. Fox McCloud perfectly linked with the game's original inspiration, the Fushimi Inari Shrine, also known as the Kyoto Fox Shrine. Fox McCloud would be assisted by three team members on his mission. They helped to add a dose of camaraderie and drama to the play sessions. The team members would be inspired by Japanese folklore, as well as staff members of Nintendo's EAD. For example, Slippy Toad was directly based on the planner of the project who had used a Toad character as an alter ego in his memoirs. The animal theme happened to fit in with the already existing animal creatures and enemies in the game. Some of them were transferred over from Argonaut's own Star Glider series as the project started out as a sequel or adaptation of this game. Composer Hirasawa created the audio samples and provided the game with a fitting cinematic score. It would be one of his first and unfortunately his last project at Nintendo. The composer was under the impression that he owned the rights to his compositions. He attempted to release an arranged album on CD without Nintendo's involvement, but ultimately had to cancel the project when the company caught wind of it. 
Being dissatisfied with the situation, he quit Nintendo and chose a completely different career path. Legendary Nintendo composer Koji Kondo handled the sound effects and audio programming. The relatively small amount of pixel art required for the game freed up extra memory for audio samples. The game could therefore include an extraordinary amount of voice samples. Come in, Cornelia. This is Cornelia, Pepper speaking. The English dialogue was voiced by Ben Osen, an employee from Nintendo of America who helped to localize a number of Super NES games. Koji Kondo took extra care to reflect the depth of the game and the sound effects. The intensity of the effects is adjusted according to their distance. The engine sound of the R-Wing also reflects the current situation. When flying through a closed environment, a heavy reverb effect helps to sell the situation. No Miyamoto production is complete without some secret levels or warps. Star Fox included a few fun secrets to add a bit of replay value to this somewhat compact game. The secret level, Another Dimension, allowed them to include some leftover ideas and further expand on tech concepts. The paper planes were born out of an idea by Miyamoto to include an origami crane bird. The slot machine at the end of this stage was an idea by Dylan to further use his scrolling texture routine. At the final stages of production, the training stage was added to the game, and a programmer from Nintendo EAD created the wipes to give the game even more cinematic flair. Production wrapped up in the autumn of 1992 after being in development for roughly a year. The following months, the cartridges, manuals, and boxes were being mass-produced. In the meantime, the game was showcased to the world with a dazzling light show at the CES trade show of January 1993. The FX chip was heavily emphasized in the marketing, and for good reason. The chip allowed for real-time 3D graphics at an acceptable frame rate, a feature that really stood out among console games. Backed up by great gameplay and unique characters, it quickly became one of the best sellers for the Super NES. The PAL market had to wait until June to get their hands on the game. The name, Star Fox, caused a copyright conflict in Europe and was renamed to Star Wing. Star Fox was a unique project. The paths of highly talented but vastly different game developers intertwined and impacted the industry in a big way. Nintendo's well-oiled development team highly focused on gameplay, and the young crew at Argonaut with their inventive solutions and know-how of 3D gaming. For the Argonaut programmers, it had been a world-changing experience working as teenagers in this well-established foreign company. For Miyamoto and his crew, it was a successful exercise in 3D gameplay. There's no denying that Argonaut played a role in getting Nintendo in shape for the next generation in video games. <laughs>